Well, this presentation is going to be on the Green River Formation. And the Green River for Formation basically was made up of uh, three ancient freshwater lakes. Well, we're going to be talking about uh, basically three lakes that were make up of the G Green River Formation. Lake Gossage, which is the bigger lake. Um, the bigger, uh, bigger lake was uh, real kind of fairly shallow, uh, prone to drying up. Uh, it covered Utah, uh, Wyoming, and as you can see, a little bit parts of Colorado. Uh, all the book cliffs, underneath the book cliffs and everything, and Douglas Pass, and the oil shale, that's all in the Green River Formation. Uh, the next lake is Lake uh, Uinta. Um, it, was, uh, the, it was kind of a, a lake that pretty well covered uh, Utah. Uh, Colorado and uh, Wyoming and you kind of get the remnants of that in soft, uh, Salt Lake. Uh, Salt Lake and Uinta Lake in Utah is all that's left. Mainly what we're going to talk about though is Fossil Lake and it was a smaller lake. It was a lot deeper and had a lot of problems in the lake in a sense but perfect for po uh, fossil pr preservation. Uh, the Green River is a geological formation about 56 to 34 million years old. And to kind of give you an example, I made up a book. And the uh, book is uh, uh, kind of, I always had kids ask me, what is a million years? Well, I made up this book. Okay, and if you can see it, okay, made up this book. It's really kind of a neat book. Stop share for a moment. Okay, there you go. And uh, in this book, I made some X's. And each X is equal to one year. All the way across 65 X's, all the way across to one side, that's 65 years old. That'd be the age of grandpa or some of us older people, uh, age of grandpa. And when you look all the way through here, there's uh, 55 rows all the way down. And in this book, there is actually one million X's all the way through it. This is just one million. So when we're talking about 35 million years ago, that would be a stack of these books about 27 foot tall. And that's only just that one lake. So that gives you a come on side idea when paleontologists talk about millions of years. And sometimes they talk about millions of years, give or take a million. They don't know exactly. So anyway, we'll get back to the Fossil Lake. Fossil Lake, uh, history of it was first recorded, fossils were found early uh, by missionaries and, and explorers uh, back in 1840. Uh, in 1856, there was a geologist named Dr. Evans that actually started collecting fossil fish. Then in about 1856 uh, or 1860, uh, some railroad workers were putting in the, uh, for the Union Pacific Railroad were putting in uh, a railroad line and they started finding all these fossil fish and they, of course they made notice of it and thought that was really kind of pretty neat and they actually called the cut that they were making uh, fossil fish cut. In uh, 1814 fossil fish were actually started to be collected and sold to the public and museums and stuff like that so when you look at that time frame, um, you're looking at over 106 or, seven million, uh, 106 or seven years ago that they were selling and buying fish. Uh, people were buying fish. Uh, so that means that over, over the years, over millions of these fossil fish have been sold and found. So it's really quite extensive, the, this fossil lake and stuff. Uh, the hobbyists have a great time, um, and so on. Uh, the lake itself uh, differs in being the 18-inch layer where, the, where some of the uh, best fish are found. Uh, uh, they're in a kind of a laminated area, and I'll explain that a little bit later, a little bit here. Uh, laminated layers, and it's in the deeper part of the lake, and they call this the 18-inch layer. Uh, these fish have to be prepared. In other words, you have to use a dental pick 
or a power, what they call an air scribe, uh, to clean the rock off the top, which is like the garfish had to be done. And that was all done by an air pick or an air scribe um, once in a while, but mostly all done by him with uh, a dental pick and uh, stuff. So, uh, so you end up with, depending on how good a preparatory you are, you end up with an actually pristine fossil fish. Um, you take like the uh, split fish layer is a little bit different. The split fish layer was then closer to the shoreline. The split fish layer was about six feet thick and uh, was fairly uh, uh, faintly, excuse me, faintly laminated. And if you kind of look at a lake with uh, a river coming in, the heavier uh, material sediment coming in will settle f first and be a, a thicker and heavier where the finer material would go out into the deeper part of the lake. And that's where you get the 18 inch layer. So anyway, let's go back, let's go to the slides and you'll have to excuse the slides a little bit because uh, the first ones are some old, old, old pictures and I was young, young, young at that time. But uh, you can kind of see, get the drift of what's uh, going on and what be able to see. So this kind of gives you some idea of what the uh, different epics and stuff in, in the Eocene period. Uh, again, there's the lake. Lake started to dry up. This is all, all that's kind of left right now. Uh, it's still lake Uanda is the only thing that's left in course, Salt Lake and stuff. All the rest of the lakes are gone. This is a kind of a, a, a road that goes up to where the quarry is. And actually the quarry is found up here towards the top of these, what the Wyoming's called mountains, but uh, up here towards the top is where the quarries are found and stuff. So it's really kind of neat. And as you can see, it's pretty barren. One of the old jokes about when you were out camping uh, in a tent camping out in Wyoming, you always had to bring your own bush to, you know, if you had to go, you go to the bathroom or something because there was no other bushes out there. But anyway, uh, kind of pretty desolate area. And here's where we were camping with the tent. And uh, on the left-hand side, that's me, but you have to excuse my appearance. Uh, when you're out there digging fish, you have a great time and uh, you get really dirty. This here is what they, you kind of get beds that are divided up in the crack lines. There's a fault line you can kind of see in the upper left-hand corner there. And this is one of the fossil fish here. And you use a, a real sharp knife, like a carpet knife or power tools to cut the rock when you find a fish and start looking and looking for them. And as you can see, they're pretty hard to see, but you can see how it laminates fairly easy. You just use a putty knife and you just scrape off. It's just kind of like uh, looking at each time you peel off a layer, you're turning a page of a book. Here's one big fish. You can see him laying here. And actually this specimen here, uh, when we found this fish, we actually found some other ones in here. And so we combined this all together and made this all in one piece. Turned out pretty nice. Once in a while, it was really kind of interesting when they were first finding these fish, they always thought they were all pristine, just perfect fish. And then they found out later that the collectors that were collecting them, whenever they found a fish that was what they call disarticulated, which means it was all in pieces and parts, they would just throw it away and they wouldn't do anything with it. So anyway, this here is a fish right here. You can see he's disarticulated. You see his backbone's all chopped up, head's all chopped up. There's actually another perfect fish sitting right here. You can actually see the tail. You can see the tail here. And here's where one of the beds are, and it just divides up the bed. Like I say, it makes a great A mess. When you do find a fish, you use, I made these, um, what I call cookie sheets. And it's got a sharp edge that you can shove over because you can't lift this stuff up because it's so soft. If you lifted it up, it would be prone to crack right in half, and then you'd have, have a mess to deal with. So you always transfer that, and then you transfer it to a board. And then you take it home and do whatever you need to do. Here you see I'm pulling it up on it. Um, and here transferring it to the board. And then when you get it home, you turn it over, clean the backside, and then actually glue it to that board. And then, uh, uh, then you're ready to do the preparation on that fish. You can actually cut it smaller, you know, because a lot of times you don't want a big slab hanging on your wall. 
And here's a big piece. You can see where I'm holding a board to stop it from sliding. And this is actually the owner of the quarry that I was working at and playing. And this is what divides up one of the beds. Here's a big slab that was getting ready to be transferred. And here's the board. And here's a perfect, what they call a notagonius, a perfect notagonius set in there. And we'll see a picture of what a notagonius is. And here we've got a power, and then you can see these beds, the different beds and different altitudes. And this is all the 18 inch layer. There's about 25 to 30 feet, and sometimes a little bit deeper that has to be taken off with a bulldozer and stuff. So it's uh, really kind of fun to play with. This is another big slab. It's a fairly long slab, but it actually has two fish on it, two large fish. Uh, kind of hard to see. We'll see some pictures where you'll really be able to see the fish. This is one weekend and you can see some of the big fish that we got stacked up in my truck. Um, in one weekend you can find quite a lot, quite a few fish. But unfortunately back in this day I used to have to sleep in my cab because eventually I used to sleep back here but then it got loaded up with fish and fish come first, you know. Again this is another picture of several little beds on one of the sides of the cliff. And this gives you some idea of what this laminated layer is. And this one layer, I kind of wanted to point it out because this one layer is about in the middle and it's full of iron oxide. And in that iron oxide is mostly, they found out that it's a volcanic uh, situation, uh, probably um, from Yellowstone that uh, caused that. Uh, you do find some fish in there and unfortunately the big fish are really disarticulated and really kind of screwed up uh, because of that iron uh, getting in there, but a lot of times the smaller fish uh, come out just absolutely perfect, and we'll see one of them here shortly. Once in a while, you do find what they call a palm frond, and if you can kind of imagine uh, palm fronds uh, up in Wyoming uh, at this time, they had palm fronds, they had alligators, and stuff like that. So, uh, the thing that's kind of bad with a <laughs> kind of bad and good uh, with a palm frond is you have to prepare it in the field and can't just take it home like the fish because you don't know how big it is. And there may be other fish with it, which sometimes happens. So you have to prepare the whole thing right there in place. And you can see how beautiful they are. They're just really nice. This one here, we found a stalk of a palm frond. And we thought, oh, we got a, We found another one. We thought, boy, two of them on one trip. But unfortunately, that's all there was, just the stalk. All the leaves were gone. And that's all, of, all it fossilized was that. And they do find insects here once in a while. They do find uh, other things like that, different kinds of leaves and stuff once in a great while. So you do find those things. Now this will kind of give you an idea of what the fish look like. Now when you're, uh, when they get a permit up there to dig these fish, mostly from state, state land, your permit is actually called, you're a fisherman from a, with a shovel. And so you shovel this dirt off and you dig up these fish. And fishing for these kind of fish is just like today when you go out and fish for fish up in the lake. What do you do? You go fishing early in the morning, later in the evening. And the reason for that is the sun, the sun hitting the shale bed will cause a shadow on the backbone of the fish. And as you can see the shadow on my hand there, how much of a shadow. And with that shadow, you can see the tail structure here. You can see a perfect backbone. You can actually see the head and you can actually tell what kind of fish it is. This here is what they call a diplomistus, one of the fairly common fish. Uh, that is found. Again, here's one with two big fish on it. And then these fish are about 20 inches long. So, I mean, they're, they're pretty good sized fish. Pretty neat when you find them. And again, you know, both of these guys died together. It's kind of neat. This here is a little guy. This is one guy that's, you got to be really sharp to see them because they're really faint. They're kind of like a sunfish. They're really, uh, a thin sh 
shaped fish. And what, boy, they're really neat when you prepare them because they have big spikes. They look really prehistoric. Most generally, they're small. Once in a great, great while, you'll find them up to six to seven inches. I have one in my collection that's eight, uh, 15 inches long. And I think it's one of the largest in the, in the world, um, or at least up there with the, with the big fish. And again, here's another big note of going. As you can see where I pencil marked here where the, where the tail was. And these are the fins that are on the bottom. And again, you can tell what kind of fish it is. It's a diplomistus. Diplomistus has a big jaw like you can see here. And he was kind of a perched, perch like fish. Now this is when the sun is a little bit higher up. And then when the sun gets higher up, you can't see the backbone, even on the big fish. And when you look at the picture between my thumbs and my fingers there, this is a pretty good sized fish. You can see a few vertebrae right in through here, which are kind of pretty, pretty good. But little fish, you won't see them at all. And so you really have to be, uh, look with that sun. A lot of times they go out uh, at night and they'll put a uh, light or some kind in the middle of the uh, quarry and then use that as a light, which is a lot cooler because it's really usually pretty hot. This particular slab here, when we clean this off, we found several fish. There's one large one here. There's one disarticulated one right here, large fish. There's another fish sitting here. There's another one right here. And there's a several little ones. There's one right here. And I think there's a little guy right here. So a lot of times when you get these things, you can kind of uh, make a picture of it and, uh, you know, for display and really end up with a nice display. Because when you look at this slab right here, if you want to take out a big piece, you're going to have two big fish, this fish, this fish, and another little fish up here. You can put them all on one slab. But it makes a pretty big piece. A lot of times they'll cut them down and make them smaller. But most people hang them on the wall. And here I'm contemplating digging some more area out. <laughs> this is the garfish. And this is what it looked like when I first started working on it. What a mess. And uh, like I say, it just took me a long time. It took me about five years to prepare this thing. And by the time I got done with it, I probably have close to 3,000 hours in uh, all the preparation and everything. And at the time when I finished it, it was the only fish that was ever prepared on both sides still in the matrix. And I built the frame and everything for it, so it really turned out really well. Um, a lot of the collectors nowadays, I don't know whether they followed my suit or whatnot, but uh, uh, they have done several now, big ones. Uh, there's only 11 uh, found in the world of this size. So that one at Eureka is pretty rare. Um, just absolutely picture perfect. Now this here is, you can actually tell the way the fish was laying when he died. This is the downside. The downside of you can picture when he float down to the bottom and get into the sediment, all the scales and everything would be stationary and held in place. Uh, what's really neat here, you can actually see the eye socket. You can actually see, if you look real close, I think I got a closer picture, but you can see the teeth just rows and rows and rows of teeth. Now on the other side, which is really kind of pretty neat, is where he had bigger teeth, and some of the bigger teeth were missing. And I think that's because of his age. But here you can see the fortification around the eye socket and stuff, and just really a pristine guy. This is the whole fish. Now this here is the upside. And if you look real close, you can see the backbone and the body of the fish actually collapsed around the backbone. So the backbone is exposed all the way down through and you actually see ribs coming down through here in between the scales, which are really kind of unusual. Kind of gives you a story. Now remember we talked about that vertebra. Now that vertebra uh, in that lake, the only thing that could survive in that lake was anaerobic bacteria. And we have them in our body, and it's right in the joint between the head and the uh, vertebra. And when we die, we kind of lose our head in a way. And that's why a lot of times 
with dinosaurs, they don't find the heads because the heads go somewhere else. But that one vertebra on all the fish that are ever found is turned. And you can see this vertebra right here. And it's always turned 90 degrees to one another. This side here again is the upside. You see the backbone coming up. And there was actually a nice cute little diplomistus setting here on the tail. This is when we were getting ready to set it up. It was really kind of fun because we had Bambi come up and she was so paranoid that she rode in the van holding it to make sure nothing happened to it on its way uh, to the Eureka. And we had some big strong boys there that help us move it, really turned out real well. This kind of gives you some idea of some of the fish. This is a fairy otis. Fairy otis was kind of a piranha type guy. You can kind of see his teeth. This here is about a 13 inch long fish. Uh, they got up to about two feet in size. So, but he was the piranha guy. And even the babies turned into a pretty vicious guy. You can see his teeth, you can actually see the eye and everything. This here is just a piece of copolite from a fish, probably. This is a little bit bigger one. This one here is almost two feet long. This here is what they call an undescribed stingray. They got two stingrays that are fresh water. This, uh, this one here is an undescribed one. Don't ask me why, the scientific people, but uh, it's one of the rarer ones to find. This is a pretty good size uh, one. It's about two feet long. Preparation. Yeah. yeah. This one here again is a what they call a myoplosis. Myoplosis has a pointed mouth on it. And you can, one thing I like about this, you can see the eye structure and look at just, just like he's looking at you. And to prepare one of these fish here, you're looking at probably close to 40 to 50 hours in preparation uh, with a fish like this. This one here is about 16 inches long. And again, a dental pick works really well. Um, a lot of the commercial people now use sandblasters. The only thing I don't like about sandblasters is what happens when you sandblast something? Well, it takes away the finish and it also etches. And so they do another process. They spray them and put something on them to bring the luster back. But the uh, bones and everything are the actual carbon remains of the fish itself. So those bones will be nice and shiny just absolutely pristine. You can actually see each individual scales going down. Really kind of pretty neat. This here is one of the diplomistuses. Again, the, you can see the fine fins and stuff. This one here is absolutely picture perfect. Just the way you want to find them. This here is one of the larger Prescacara, big spines. Pretty neat, again, the eye. Unfortunately, this rock was split in half, busted in half, and had to be put back together. This one here is kind of a neat slab when I found it. It's what they call a notagonia. See, it was a bottom feeder. It was a sucker type fish. You can see the sucker mouth here. Uh, this here is a nidea, one of the real common fish. They didn't get much more than six inches in size. Uh, really kind of pretty neat. Kind of everybody fed on them. This here is actually a crocodile tooth laying with it. And also, if you look at all, if you look real close, this here is plant material and some kind of a vine or seaweed. And there's actually seed pods. You can see seed pods connected to it on the way up. Kind of an interesting thing. What makes these notagonias as rare is that they will usually stay in closer to shore, shoreline, rather than coming out into the deeper water. So when they get out in the 18 inch layer, they're pretty rare to be found. This one here is only about three inches long. This is another fairy otis. Uh, unfortunately, when they're small like that, they're really hard to kind of keep together. But then look at the teeth on this guy. You know, for being just a little, little fella, he has some pretty vicious teeth, kind of like a piranha. <laughs> Again, another uh, Prescacara. This one here kind of give you a good example. This is Prescacara on one side. 
um, this picture in this next picture, this is looking at the edge. This is only about an eighth of an inch thick at the most and really thin. And I had to stabilize the one backside, make sure it didn't break in half. But you can see how thin it is uh, when you find those. Again, you can see the fish there. Now when we talk about disarticulated, scientific people like the disarticulated ones because it's kind of like doing an autopsy on a fish. Uh, this one here, you can actually tell what kind of fish it was with the big teeth. He was a big Ferriotis. You can see the big teeth here, jawbone. This is the upper skull. Uh, this is actually the tail vertebra here and pieces and parts all over. Uh, you see some rib bones and stuff. So they have a great time uh, looking at all this kind of stuff. Most generally, most people throw these away because they're a pain. Uh, I went and prepared this thing and it took me forever, but it really turned out pretty well and I really like it. This is a big palm frond I found uh, that I have in my personal collection. Uh, it's really kind of pretty neat also. Uh, it stands about five foot something tall, pretty good size. This is where I have it all framed and everything all done. Uh, it really looked pretty neat, pretty impressive piece. This is kind of a blurry picture, you have to excuse me, but you can kind of see it's uh, two leaves sitting together and stuff and really you do find leaves and you do find insects and stuff. Um, if you're really rare in closer to shore in the split fish area, they find a lot of, they, they find some turtles, not a lot, but they do find some turtles. And this one here is really a really neat one. So they do find turtles. They do find other things like a bowl constrictor they had found. Uh, this here is up actually up in the museum up there in, in uh, Kimmer. Uh, they actually do find birds and stuff and actually up on Douglas Pass I have found bird feathers uh, in the oil shale up there on Douglas Pass. I'm going to switch just a little bit. This here is a bunch of nidias and this is a mass, what they call a massive death layer. And in the massive death layer, uh, this actually comes from the Lake Gossage area. And it's a little bit different. The fossilization is a little bit different with the lake. Remember we talked about being prone to drying up. If you kind of look at these, there's like little clusters. If you can kind of look at here's a cluster and here's a cluster of them. And they're getting the last little bit of uh, oxygen out of the water before it finally dried up and was gone. This is a, this is a big, pretty good sized piece. I've only seen two with anything other than nidias from Lake Gossage. And I don't know why, they do find uh, um, catfish once in a while. And they do find these guys, which are what they call an amia, which are very rare, very rare out of uh, Fossil Lake. This kind of comes out of uh, Lake Gossage area. Uh, in this piece here, it was kind of close to shore, remember we talked about, uh, these are some pieces of wood uh, that have floated, floated in with the rest of it. The rest of these are nidias and stuff, but you can see where the wood was laying here and stuff. So kind of different from like uh, the other lake. Um, this one here is a, what they call uh, an amia that if you want to write a story, this is a story right here. Uh, this is probably a mother fish and some fish, um, take care of their young rather than just let them go. And if you look at all these little black dots, here's one here and all of these here through here with the black dots are all baby fish. And when mama died, all the baby fish followed her to her, to her grave. And you can see all the baby fish kind of following. So sometimes you run into a, uh, you know, a story and once in a while you find something like this which is extremely rare. Um, I was with the guy who did the prepared uh, this, prepared this and had it for sale down to Tucson, which was a big gem and mineral show. And uh, I asked him how much he got for it, but he wouldn't tell me, but it went to China. Um, so uh, we don't get to see it, but uh, really nice. It's only about uh, four foot long. And these are some Presca Cara that were with it but really a neat, uh, neat, 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 neat specimen. 
And that's the end. And then uh, kind of with ending, I wanted to kind of, uh, in closing, I wanted to encourage everybody to get out there, see what you can find. You know, when you look at Grand Junction area, it is an ideal area for collecting. Uh, some of the best leaves and fossil leaves, remember we talked about, are found up on Douglas Pass, which is only about 60 miles away. Uh, you can drive there with your car, so it's a real easy access uh, to get to. Uh, really a lot of fun, especially for kids. Um, every time I take kids up there, they always come home with a whole bunch of stuff. And then mom and dad's wondering, what the hell am I going to do with all this stuff? But uh, anyway, they have a great time. Uh, towards the Cisco area, you can run into petrified wood. Uh, what they call barite nodules or barite pseudomorphs and agate, but also I always encourage everybody to be aware of the collecting regulations because there is some regulations on some of this stuff. So make sure you know that you're on private land or public land um, or on private land. Make sure you know where you are. Fossil Butte National Monument is managed by the National Park uh, Service. It's about 15 miles west of Kimmer, Wyoming. Um, it's center, the center that they have there is extraordinary assemblage of uh, Eocene fossils and plants and animals uh, associated with Fossil Lake. So if you ever go up that, that area, uh, it's really worthwhile to stop in and see that uh, museum that they have there. Uh, there are several split fish quarries that during the summer they have what they call feed to dig uh, that you can go in and, and dig your own fossil. Uh, fossil fish and take them home and uh, so it's really kind of really pretty neat to also do that just get on the internet look up Kimmer Wyoming fossil fish and there'll be a whole list of different uh, commercial uh, collect uh, dealers that uh, do deal with fish uh, Rick who's the owner of what they call Warfield Quarry um, he is one of the guys that I know the best uh, really neat guy him and his wife and uh, stuff and they all they also have all the equipment. Um, well, most of all the quarries there have their own equipment, so you don't need to worry about, do I need a shovel, do I need a whatever. They usually have everything. And they also have services that if you find a bigger fish and you want it prepared, they will actually offer to do the preparation for you. So it's really kind of pretty neat. So that's about all. Does anybody have any questions on anything? Well, thank you, Mel. I really enjoy looking at all of those um, pictures of all the fossil fish. Yeah. They're fun. Fun to play with. Like I said, I've been doing it for a lot of years and prepared a lot of fish, too. <laughs>